What's the ratio of music to painting like in your life at the moment? Music to painting is, I mean, actually over the last few days, 100% music, um, I'm sorry, 100% painting, no music. I don't know, it kind of flip-flops. I've never really been very good at doing the two at the same time. I kind of get annoyed and bothered with one. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. And I kind of quit and I go to doing the other one. And then I'm kind of in that for a bit and the same thing happens. So I kind of flip-flop between the two. You know, music is it's probably 80%, 90% music to painting, but I don't ever do them kind of simultaneously. It's one than the other. What have you been painting the last few days? When does this come out? Probably next week. Okay, I'm doing i I'm doing like a commission for someone's Christmas present, but I won't say it's a <laughs> it's a good friend of mine, <laughs> which is actually really you know normally I kind of try and paint my own stuff and that leads to kind of you know worrying about what you should be doing or kind of coming up with ideas. Whereas if it's just a commission, you know I've just got to make it as good as I can and it's someone else's idea and then it's done and I can just give it to someone else and it's over. I'm really enjoying it actually. It's kind of like a puzzle or something, you know. It's a task and you do it and then there's an end to it and you can just let it go. That's interesting. Have you ever worked on music in a similar way? Or there's a kind of angle that's been set by someone else that you're trying to work toward? Um, I've I've produced songs for other people and kind of done remixes and things like that, which is kind of similar, I guess, you know. Like you're given a brief and they're coming to you with something and you kind of you you've got to help them out and make it the best you can, but ultimately it's their piece of work, you know. So, yeah, I, I produced a few songs for a guy called Bryce a few years ago and a few songs for my friend called San Jose. And, you know, I you know, I tried my hardest. I wanted them to be good. And I was really happy with what happened with them. But at the end of the day, they're their songs. So you just give in to them and they take them off and, I don't know, try and make them massive hits. <laughs> Is there anything that can, uh, that can carry over into, you know, producing your own music? Are there lessons that you kind of learn working on those songs for the people that then feed into what you're crafting? Yeah, I think so. Like when you're working with other people, there is a time limit on it. And, you know, I've got a studio in my back garden where I'm sitting now, actually. And with my own stuff, you can kind of tinker and tinker forever and get lost in that. Whereas with other people, there's a time limit and you've got to do it to a deadline. And I think working with those two people certainly made me realise that, you know, I could work within a time frame, finish something and just let go of it and then let it exist without worrying too much. So... I definitely learned that. How long have you had the studio in the back garden? About four years now. Me, me, so me and Jamie, the guitarist of Bombay Bicycle Club, bought a, a house in North London together, which was split into two flats. It was a, an amazing find. We would never normally find anything like this. And in the back of the garden, there was kind of a breeze block shed. And the idea was that we convert it into a studio and use it for the band and everything else. So about four years ago me and some friends like soundproof the whole thing and it I mean it does a really good job of it you can play drums all night you can make music all night and then for the first year of having it I I just used it for partying late at night really <laughs> it wasn't the most productive thing but I just had this completely soundproof thing at the end of my garden so you know I'd work in the day but then if I went to a party it would get to I don't know two three in the morning and you could come back here and go as long as you wanted which was quite fun but it's also you know, you know, it's like a dangerous thing to have the very dangerous tool. Too tempting. Yeah. I've since got, I mean, with lockdown, there's no one to party with anyway, so I'm only being productive in here. Have you found yourself being more productive as a result of lockdown? I mean, or? in general life, I've definitely been way more productive, you know. With kind of, with endless free time, which I've got at the moment, I think you need structure, otherwise you're going to lose your mind. So I've tried to keep my days busy, whether that be with music or painting or just kind of running or cooking or anything like that. I've I've tried to keep my days busy. As I said before, with music, it kind of flip-flops between being productive and me never wanting to do it again. So, you know, there's been weeks or months where I've been very productive and then other other times where I've just completely put it down and, and not wanted to have anything to do with it. But, yeah, on on the whole, I think having no distractions whatsoever... I've been, yeah, I've been, probably been the most productive I've been in my life, really. Are those periods of, of you know, increased productivity and then, and then nothing at all when it comes to music, can you, can you tell what's fueling them or is it kind of completely random? I don't think it's completely random. Though I, I don't think it's always the same thing fueling them. You know, with this, it was kind of the expanse of time, having free time in front of me that was fueling it. 
and wanting to keep myself busy, I guess, I guess at the heart of it, there's always that fear that I'm not using my time well and I need to be more productive. I guess that fuels a lot of my creativity, just kind of worrying about things. <laughs> Actually, I mean, talking to you now, I, I've mentioned worrying about things a lot, so maybe I'm just entirely fueled by worrying about things. But I, I hope there's something always... more to it. I've, I've definitely worried about making the most out of my time and being productive, yeah. But, um, I mean, yeah, this lockdown, it was that gave me the impetus to do it. Other times, you know, when you're younger or when you haven't, when I hadn't done anything myself, like when I started doing Toothless, I was kind of, I guess I was eager to prove myself. And that wasn't so much a worry about time. It was kind of wanting to show myself that I could do something on my own and being excited to create, actually. Like with that project, I was really, really keen to get going just because I had a lot to say and a lot to do. Had you built up a bank of songs going into it as well? I thought I had. With Toothless, you know, you start anything and you think, or at least I thought it was going to be good from the get-go and I thought I had loads of songs and ideas and as you work through them, you come up with better things and then you get better yourself and you realise what you went into it with wasn't as good as you perhaps thought. Yeah, with Toothless, I think I wrote, I think I wrote like 90% of the songs after I started doing the project itself. So I guess from December 2014 until the record came out at the beginning of 2017. Is that in part what gives them that kind of na- narrative kind of you know thematic cohesiveness you know you've, you've kind of got the mythology thing going on for the most part yeah for sure certainly all the lyrics came within that period of time and i was really learning how to write lyrics then as well you know that's something i'd never really done i play guitar and i play bass and i'd been doing that for years in various bands and with bombay bicycle club you know i had been doing it professionally for a long time so i knew how to do that but writing lyrics and singing you, you know, it was completely new to me, but it was a necessity if I wanted to write the songs I wanted to do and have control over it. So, yeah, those songs were written in that kind of two-year period, and all the lyrics came from that period. You know, I hadn't really tried to write lyrics before that. I'd come up with guitar ideas and song structures and melodies and things like that, but in terms of lyrics, I'd never even had a go at it, really. And also, you could, I mean, I could feel it listening back to them. You can feel them develop and change and grow over that period as I was writing them. Something quite nice about that though. Oh totally like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing the evolution directly in it, yeah. I mean Toothless really was just kind of a, a massive learning process for me when I look back at it. You know, at the time I kind of I thought it was the be all and end all and if it was the last thing I would have done I'd have been happy with it. But now I look back I guess three, four years from releasing that record, it was it was me learning to make music by myself without leaning on anyone else learning to write lyrics learning to sing really like i mean i still can't sing but when i started doing that i really really couldn't sing and just developing that skill and trying to work that out why do you think you can't sing i like my voice actually i i like the the tone to it and i think there's something unique but i think i can't sing because i can't hit the notes that i want to (laughs) And I mean, there's, do you know the band Silver Jews? One of his lyrics Yeah, Stephen is, Malkmus. Well, Stephen Malkmus was in it, yeah, yeah, um, for, that, for that record with that lyric on, actually. But the other guy, David Berman, who was leading it, one of his lyrics is, all my favourite singers couldn't sing. And, I mean, it's true of Stephen Malkmus, it's true of David Berman, and, I mean, I think it's kind of true of me. I can't really use my voice in the same way that I'd like to be able to. It's not super skilled, but I'm happy with what I'm able to do with it, you know. In in kind of its flawedness, there's something special about it, or at least I hope there is. Well, there's an honesty about it. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a David Byrne quote as well, isn't it, that the, oh, really? the better the singer, the harder it is to relate to them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with it. And all my favourite singers can't sing, you know. I love, I love, well, Silver Jews, I love Pavement, Modest Mouse. Even like Joanna Newsom, I mean, she can kind of technically sing, but there's something crazy about it, something unique and honest. And when you listen to these people that are amazing at singing, it just, there's, there's kind of, you, you relate to it less. It doesn't feel as emotive, or at least to me it doesn't. You know, I'd much rather listen to Modest Mouse than, I don't know, anyone on the radio today or anyone auto-tuned or, I don't know, big rock bands that can sing. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. Auto-tunes are interesting because it's almost bringing something completely different and it's almost like a, you know it's a very conscious sense of artifice yeah yeah i mean i i used to tune my vocals all the time 
especially when we were doing, or when I was doing Toothless at the beginning, I was really worried about not being in tune because I was aware of kind of the, how I couldn't sing really. I was super scared about it and now I don't really give a fuck. Like, if I don't tune anything, it, it is how it is. And I, yeah, as you say, I guess it's natural. What prompted that revelation? I think listening back to people I respect and admire, my favorite musicians, and you kind of, you don't notice when they're not in tune if you believe what they're singing. Something doesn't have to be technically perfect. And I was like, well, why am I trying to do that? If I can't do it, it doesn't really matter so much. So I just stopped doing it. And actually, I've been a lot happier with my vocal recording since that point. It's interesting as well what we're saying about, you know, you know the, the, the Toothless record was written over a very kind of, what did you say, two-year period? Kind of quite a concise period? Yeah. These songs, they kind of come from more of a, a scattershot time. They're kind of taken from over the last few years, a bit of a longer... You mean the music I'm putting out myself now? Yeah. Um, are they? Are they or? Well, I guess... I guess since the Toothless record came out, really, so what is that, three and a half years ago? Though the three, the three that have come out were written in quite short succession, but the stuff I'm going to start putting out, there's, you know, there's some songs that are three years old. There's some songs that, I guess, predate the Toothless record as well that I'm planning on putting out. So, yeah, I guess it's a much longer time than the Toothless one. I was really, really keen to put that out quickly, and this, this stuff, I'm, you know, I'm not rushing at all. I'm just doing it when and as I feel like. I mean, when you listen to a song, can you tell when it's from? Are there certain giveaways from the period that it's come from in your life? <laughs> well, I guess perfect tuning, if I've tuned it, it's probably from when I was still using auto-tune. Um, but, yeah, lyrics, I mean, with all the toothless stuff, it, it was, as you say, it was kind of metaphor and stories and other people's stories, so it's like mythology. Yeah, it was just hidden behind other people's stories. And as I've continued to write, it's become you know more personal more more relatable they're just there's there's no hiding behind anything they're just kind of stories about how i felt that week or how i felt that day or what was going on in my life and i you know they're fairly honest snapshots of that time it makes quite quite a nice sense to take the auto tune off of it or take the the slight tuning you know off of it when it's now completely your story and yeah totally i'm told from your perspective i guess all of those things are true you grow into yourself as a songwriter and you feel more comfortable feeling feel more comfortable in your voice feel more comfortable writing about yourself um and as a musician i guess that that is a, that's the progression isn't it and you can kind of see it with this or at least i can looking back at it as you develop as a songwriter does that feed into your progression and and your kind of development as a person in life are there parallels there do they kind of feed into each other i'm i'm sure they do it's, I guess it's just growing up on confidence, isn't it? I feel, I, I mean, I feel a better person than I was five years ago when I was writing that stuff. I feel more secure in myself. Whether or not the music was directly taken from me being more secure in myself or vice versa, I don't know. But it's it's probably just growing up, isn't it? From the age of yeah. 25 to 30, it's a huge amount of change you go through. It's an intense period. Yeah, it's, it's well, I guess it's becoming a, a real adult. I'm sure there's a lot of people that would say you're a real adult before the age of 25, but I don't know. For me, there was a huge amount of change, leaving Bombay Bicycle Club, stopping that, starting something new, and starting life in its own right, you know, away from this kind of framework. You're, you don't know, going out by myself, I guess. How did life compare to what you expected of it? Because, I mean, yeah, I guess you you're quite isolated when you're in that kind of band world for... I mean, what was it, like a six-year period, seven-year period? When we did Bombay? Um, no, we did. I was 15 when we started that band. Oh, so 15 years. to 25, yeah, 10 years. So that is really a huge amount of development. And I guess we had a, a very different experience to most people. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I didn't have any other experience, so I can't compare it to anything. But I imagine it was fairly strange. You know, I was busy and on tour all the time. And it's kind of within a framework as well. A lot of things are planned for you. You're kind of, you're not fending for yourself in the same way that you might be if you, you know, leave school or leave home and go to university. At 25, when I left the band, you kind of have to reckon with all that stuff that a lot of people do a lot sooner. Yeah. Is it harder to reckon with them when it's been built up for a while? Because you then have, you obviously have the added pressures as well of kind of coming towards the end of your 20s that other people have to deal with too. I'm, it's probably not harder, you know, it's probably... There's probably good things and bad things about both of them. Um, 
it is a bit later in life to kind of try and work out where you are and what you want to do because like you we were kind of on a roller coaster really you know you get on and it was only when i was 25 that i decided i wanted to do music you know before then it was kind of decided for me in a way although i mean i'm not going to pretend it was like the hardest thing in the world it's you know it's pretty nice having a successful career and being able to play in a band for ages and you know touring the world and all that stuff so although you you know you've had a successful career when you get to 25 are there other pressures that come from that as a result of kind of having achieved so much at that point in your life does the future seem maybe slightly more daunting in some ways or I don't think it's more daunting I think there is kind of perhaps pr- pressure to succeed or to you know keep it up because it, it went really well for us for those 10 years and it went better and better and you know we had fans and played bigger and bigger shows and released more successful records so then to go the other way and do things that are less successful which is inevitable you know Toothless was way less successful I guess that's daunting because you kind of you're used to things being a certain way and then realizing that that's actually not how the world works at all yeah I mean commercially but not necessarily artistically yeah yeah I'm, I'm only I guess I'm only talking commercially I guess you can't I guess creatively you kind of just have to do what you feel is right at the time you can't really predict that or kind of have a preconceived idea about that creatively and what I was making maybe there's less of a pressure though there, people would always compare and did compare what I did myself to Bombay Bicycle Club which was for the most part from the mind of someone else you know so there was there was that kind of pressure I guess how far ahead are you planned at the moment then in terms of what's coming up for this solo project do you have an idea in your mind of where you what you what you kind of have for like release plan wise and what you're wanting to do with it or is it something that's a little bit more spontaneous this is actually entirely spontaneous and quite a refreshing way with everything else i've ever done <clears throat> you know there's months and months planned and you're like okay we'll do an album in six months and then an ep and then you're going to do some singles from that and go on tour i always wanted to release some more music under my own name and having the free time as i said gave me the impetus to do it so i'm just doing it on a song by song basis when I like the song and when I'm happy with it I don't even know what the next song I'm going to put out is <laughs> so that that's how far ahead I, I I know you know I know until about the next song which at this point I don't even know I mean long time I, I want to keep doing it I want to keep releasing songs that I'm happy with maybe do an album and an EP if if I kind of have a vision for it but at the moment it's it's very very spontaneous does that bleed into the songwriting that you're currently you know doing at the moment that kind of idea of spontaneity in relation to the creativity yeah i think so like the last song i put out i wrote this year finished it off a week before i had to go on spotify and it's a it's less than two minutes which i don't think i've ever done before and the one before that which was also written you know a few weeks before it came out is a six minute song i don't think i'd ever done that and i think if i was putting stuff out under toothless or certainly with bombay if you're going to do a six minute song or a two minute song you'd think about it long and hard and think about if it was the right look or the right decision and you know whether it's too long for certain things or too short for other things whereas with this i'm just kind of throwing stuff at the wall seeing what people like and that's the other nice thing, actually. You can kind of you can have a dialogue with people because it's so low key and spontaneous. People send me messages on Instagram, or whatever, and tell me what they like, what they don't like, and you can kind of adjust for what people like, or you can kind of think about that person when you're writing your next song because you know it's it's coming out as you as you write it. Do you quite often think about people when you're writing tracks? I don't write to kind of please people. But yeah, you you can kind of. I, I think that's always once you start putting music out, you're all, it's always going to be in the back of your mind. I mean, with the six minute song I did, I was like, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if people will listen to all of this. It didn't change what I did, but I certainly thought about whether whether people would listen to the whole thing or not. And I think they did for the most part. I think it went down okay. Certainly better than the two minute song I did. I mean, did you did you have an idea for the narrative of that six minute song? when you started working on it or was it something that kind of started to take shape in the process yeah that that kind of came out bit by bit so i wrote the first two and a half minutes which is you know pretty normal pop song um first chorus first chorus and then this was over lockdown or over the summer you know when everything wasn't really happening i was 
just tinkering with it in my studio because I'd come out here every day and try and be productive. And I'd add like another section I liked and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to keep that. And I just kept on adding bits onto it until it became, you know, a completely different beast by the end. And then, as I said, normally you'd kind of think about it, make it more concise maybe, kind of shorten it, tinker with it. But I just thought I'd put it out like that. So I did. It comes back to that idea that we were speaking about with the vocals as well in terms of keeping things raw and kind of allowing that honesty to shine through. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like, yeah, it's almost like capturing a song pre it kind of being transformed in some ways. Like it's more raw. With those, the the last two I did, you're kind of capturing the initial spark of the song, the exciting bit and just putting it out before you can really like take it apart or ruin it or overthink it. I mean, actually with with the first song I put out, a song called Think You Feel The Same, the guitars on it are played terribly. And they're the, literally the first time I ever played them to record them. When I came up with the idea, I just played them. And I went back to finish the song off and I tried to re-record them properly, which I did. But there was something, I don't know, there was something so nice and spontaneous and kind of magical about the first time I did it that I just kept the original. But I mean, they sound terrible as far as, you know, recording, recording proper guitars go or playing goes. But there's something special about it. I think it's a similar thing to Modest Mode, though, in the same way that you're saying you don't notice if he's out of tune if it's kind of delivered with a certain conviction and honesty people get that and they kind of they don't see that they're not played to as well as they could be yeah totally i i think it's it's about vibe isn't it it's about feeling and believing someone whatever that is and the more technically proficient it is the less you can relate to it because it be- kind of it becomes something that's unobtainable especially with guitar playing and things like that or singing actually you know if something's unobtainable you can't relate to it so much I don't want to listen to music with people doing incredible guitar solos and shredding. I want to listen to, you know, I don't know, I've been listening to a lot of Daniel Johnston and people like that. And he can barely play guitar, but I'd rather listen to that than anyone that could play well any day. There is something as well though that is slightly fascinating about that idea of the perfect pop song and something that's kind of constructed wonderfully. Mm, I totally agree with that. Like with Daniel Johnston, if you listen to some of those, I'd say they're pretty pretty concise pop songs but they're super simple you know it doesn't have to be anything fancy like teenage kicks is one of the prime examples or like a nirvana song it's like three chords they could barely play guitar the lyrics are with teenage kicks they're silly you know they're just like really kind of they could pass you by but there's something about the the vibe of the whole thing that makes it the most concise enjoyable feel good song that i've ever heard yeah i mean again it comes down to that conviction yeah totally I mean, it's interesting that you say, like, when, you know, the first two and a half minutes of that kind of fall into that, that idea of the pop song structure. It's very Beatlesy, and it's kind of, it is quite classical in terms of its, you know, narrative and, and some of the word choice as well. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of, <laughs> it was meant to be a bit silly, a bit tongue in cheek, you know, using words like baby and darling and honey. Yeah, I would never use those words in real life, but when you slot them into a song, they, you know, it becomes becomes more believable it becomes something else like the beatles i'm sure they weren't calling baby and people baby and darling all the time or maybe they were i don't know i don't know what people <laughs> were saying in the 60s but it certainly isn't normal for me but in that song in that context it becomes more believable yeah for sure i mean are there other things that you can say in your songwriting that you wouldn't otherwise get away with saying in life i don't think i get away with saying a lot of it in real life <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that's kind of that's why you write songs isn't it it's you can kind of you suspend reality and belief and all the rest of it and you enter you enter a different world really and you can kind of you can say things you wouldn't normally say or you can bend the truth or you can exaggerate or be i don't know like when as an example is very hyperbolic you know you have to exaggerate or you don't have to exaggerate but it works to get a point across it doesn't mean that's how you feel all the time or you know I, i'm say i said before that it's honest and those songs are honest but you've got to exaggerate or you've got to bend things or make them fit within rhyming structures so they're believable as a song as well you can't just or at least i couldn't just say it f- normally flat exactly like as it is otherwise it wouldn't be very fun to listen to does it scratch a certain itch though putting these things into a song that you that you wouldn't be able to kind of just you know say in normal conversation yeah, I guess so, yeah. I think it's cathartic and therapeutic. Like writing writing songs is cathartic and therapeutic. I could have written all of those songs and they never come out and they'd have made me feel better for putting them for putting pen to paper. I guess it's like keeping a journal or a diary or something like that. Do you remember the first time that 
you know, you discovered songwriting was cathartic in that way. What did I do? I th- think you feel the same would have been one of the first times that I felt that, which is the first song I put out under my own name a few months ago. When was that song written? That was written beginning of 2018. And, I, you know, slightly hyperbolic, slightly exaggerated, but by and large kind of is honest. I think that's one of the first times I was kind of honest in a song, you know, with Toothless. It, w- it was hidden behind a lot of metaphor and stories, as we were saying before. I mean, I, I guess you can, even if it was an in- instrumental song, you know, you can pick up a guitar and just hammer out a few chords and that feels good and that's quite cathartic within itself. So I guess I've been doing it for years. Or playing other people's songs is also very cathartic. It's kind of just being proactive and doing something. Does the catharsis differ when it's someone else's song compared to your own? I think it's probably less cathartic. You know, you're thinking about someone else's experience, even if you relate to it as opposed to telling a story about your own experience. How does that compare then? I mean, if it's a, you know, playing with Bombay over the last 15 years now then? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> that's a horrifyingly long time, isn't it? I mean, on the last record, you penned a couple of the songs, though. Does that, does that differ on stage then when you're performing your own ones? Like, because you, it was a good day you did. Yeah, and actually, I... I take back the answer to my last question. Good Day was the real turning point in um, me being entirely honest and using a song as a way of kind of getting feelings and thoughts out. Um, that that would have been the turning point. I mean, that's a song that kind of looks at the the small things that trouble you as well as the the slightly larger ones. I mean, what is it? Um, the floating ice caps in my drink, juxtaposing the big existential, you know, global warming, end of the world with the... Mm kind of minutia of every day yeah it was well, yeah you hit the, hit the nail on the head that was it that's exactly it but it's kind of with with that line it's you know you're juxtaposing the big excess big problems in the world with the kind of relatively small ones you have yourself and it's kind of that whole song's about not worrying so much and don't not sweating the small stuff and i think that line kind of sums it up you know there are much bigger things to worry about than you know all these little little bits and bobs going around our heads all the time what occupies your headspace more? The kind of small ones or the big ones? Um, <laughs> it's. I mean, at the moment, definitely the big ones. Um, I, I think it flip flops. You know, try to avoid. At, yeah, this year has been a very difficult one for it. Um, my mind's been very much caught up in the big ones, and actually, it's a year where the big ones have affected everyone's kind of small life decisions as well. They've completely got in the way. I mean, before we started recording, we were talking about that. It's just taken it, c- taken control away from everyone's life for a little while. But yeah, um, the big ones at the moment. There's a weird kind of parallel between touring there, you know, kind of taking the control of your life. Like, in some ways, you kind of have more freedom than ever before because although you're stuck inside, you can do whatever you want and certain pressures have been taken away. Mm. But in the same way that touring is, you're kind of locked in this schedule and you can't leave the home pretty much. Yeah, it's it's a bizarre double-edged sword and you can see... I mean, it, within my own experience, like I've, I've enjoyed it a lot, and it's made me incredibly unhappy. Being able to do things that you don't often get the time to do, or you feel like you shouldn't be doing, like I don't know, spending all your time reading or playing video games or watching TV, you can kind of do those things, but at the same time, you can't actually do the things you should be getting on with or really want to do, like seeing your friends or family or I don't know, touring. <laughs> I mean, so you wouldn't have played any of these songs live now when we think back to like the last, um, you know, the Toothless record. Yeah. Did those songs kind of take on a different quality for you once you performed them in that live space? No, I, that's one thing I, I learnt a lot with Toothless, Play, like playing live. I wanted, just from the get-go, I wanted the songs to be kind of big and bombastic live because there were so many parts of them on the record. And I just, I never did them justice I don't think I never got them sounding good live because I wanted them to sound perfect and they could never sound perfect you know it's I had to put a band together for it and I was learning you know to be a front man and to kind of sing consistently live and I wanted them to be these like grand things and I never got there so my mind was somewhere else when I was playing them live thinking about the song itself as opposed to being in the moment or singing the song so I think if people saw me doing those ones live, they wouldn't have believed it. I think my head was somewhere else. I think that's since changed. I think I know how to do these ones live, and I'm looking forward to like when we can finally play them, getting out there. 
would you be tempted then to try and do a toothless song justice in an Ed Nash set? Yeah, I th- I think I would. Though I d- I don't know if doing it justice in the way that I thought before is the right way of thinking about it. Like with these songs I'm doing now, I plan on just turning up with a guitar and singing them myself. As we said before, I think that's kind of the most honest and realistic way to do it. And I think that will probably come across the best. So yeah, with Toothless songs, I'd happily play them. And I'd happily play songs like Good Day like that and really kind of put myself behind them as opposed to worrying about if the drums sound good or if the backing track's in time or if my, I don't know, if my distortion pedal's working. Just kind of remove all of those all of those things that don't really matter and get down to the heart of the song. Yeah, just getting beneath the noise and getting to the, the kind of narrative mm. at the core of it. I mean, I'm, I am fascinated by this idea, though, of the Greek myths and the way on that, that first record you kind of appropriated them and compared them to your own life. Are the Greek myths that you compared to your own life then, would they differ now? Would you compare different, would you use different Greek myths if you were kind of tackling that record at this point in your life in comparison to what's going on? Um, I, pr- I probably would. As we said before, I've definitely grown up a lot and feel more confident. I mean, there'd probably, there'd probably be more positive Greek myths than the ones I use then. I mean, some of them still remain the same. What, what did I do? Sisyphus, you know, that that was kind of a story about friendship as opposed to how I felt myself about the same mistake happening over and over again and kind of being there for someone regardless of the mistakes they make. So that one that one would hold true. Some of the other that ones I don't know. pushing a boulder up a hill, right? Yeah, Sisyphus, um, his, he was punished by having to roll a boulder up a hill every day and it fell down and he had to do the same thing every day. So this idea of rep- like repetition and having to do the same thing kind of went into that song. That's interesting that it's about a friendship. I always thought about that as like a relationship that wasn't panning out. Yeah, I mean, you, that it, it, would, it would work just as well with that. It It is about a relationship, but though I didn't intend it to be a romantic one. It's just about someone, you know, fucking up, making the same mistake and you being there for them or vice versa, you making a mistake and someone being there for you. But I mean, it rings true of romantic relationships true too. I mean, does it change the way that you think about these experiences in your own life when you can make that comparison to a Greek myth and kind of draw that, that parallel? Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I guess that's why <laughs> that's why Greek myths are there, or all these kind of myths, is to tell you stories about your own life and kind of educate people with metaphor. Yeah, it's like Aesop's Fables as well. Yeah, that kind of timeless quality that you can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could have written songs about like the hare and the tortoise, or I don't know. This, the what's the other one? The just so stories. I guess they're not quite the same. I mean, have you always been quite into your kind of mythology? And that sort of thing. Yeah, I I love it. I I just I like small stories like that with um a moral or a meaning, or I and metaphors as well. I just love metaphors and music, which is why I think I learnt so heavily on it while doing that. I mean, when you're painting mm-hmm. as well, are metaphors also something you utilize? Are you kind of drawn to the same things in either of the art forms, or does it tend to differ? It's actually that's interesting. You ask that. It's completely the opposite. I have no interest in, or I say no interest, I've got much, much less interest in conceptual art or art that uses metaphors or has kind of hidden meanings. And really, I like just straight down the line, landscapes and portraits and figurative art, which is really strange because that's the opposite to what I like in music and what I look for in music. Does what inspire you to paint and what inspires you to write music differ then? I guess so. As I said before, I... Painting is kind of like a puzzle to me. You know, it's like working out where to, how to use colours and how to blend paint and kind of how to make something real. I guess it doesn't need to be real, but make an image that you're happy with with the medium of paint that just looks good for what it is. Whereas with music, I like things to be short and concise and pop song, poppy and kind of catchy. But um, lyrics do mean a lot, and I, I like it when people tell stories or have hidden meanings or metaphor in their songs. I mean, I guess the painting when you're kind of doing it, you know, face on, it's less open to interpretation in some ways than maybe if you're kind of just trying to replicate something, you know, <laughs> face on with paint. Well, I guess people can interpret what they want, but I hope people aren't trying to interpret my paintings because there's very little thought that goes into it. 
But you know, people people interpret Oasis songs like they're masterpieces of kind of metaphor and <laughs> lyrics, and I'm sure they're not. I'm so sure they're not. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're kind of just ripping off uh, Beatles a little bit, but yeah. I mean, they're just lyrically, I think they're just words that fit to like obviously very strong melodies. Like the melodies and the songs are strong, but I really don't think he meant anything by them. Mate, there's, an, there's something interesting about that quality, though, where people impart their own thing onto it. There's almost an, he almost has an ability to leave them open in a way that's what allows them to resonate. Like often we find that songs resonate, you know, when they're really intensely specific, but he's kind of the opposite of that. <laughs> he leaves them so open that anyone can impart anything onto it. I think if if someone thinks they're a genius and then you look at them you, and they think they're a genius, you're like, okay, he must have more going on than what is actually there, you know? I th- I think that confidence makes you believe there's more than is actually there. It's like a smart man is smart enough to know they're not smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure people think much the same of me and it, it's very true of myself, but yeah. Does songwriting shift your perspective on yourself, though? Does it? Because it, I mean, it kind of gives you a way to look at yourself in a way that you couldn't otherwise. I don't know about the songwriting itself. I kind of, I do flick between thinking I've done something great and feeling very good about myself, and then thinking things are terrible, and feeling terrible within the space of like five ten minutes. You know, it can it can really alter the way you feel about yourself. I don't know. I don't know about giving you another perspective on yourself. Though I'm 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 sure other people get that from it. I don't. I. I guess I don't have. There's. I'm not trying to do kind of a big picture thing or make a point outside of myself. Really, I'm just saying what's going on in my head or saying words that I like or talking about stories that I like. I'm not kind of not stepping outside of myself. When it drastically alters your mood in that way, you know, something that can kind of shift your your headspace pretty quickly in the space of five to ten minutes. Does it then take you a while to kind of come back from that? Are you in that headspace for the rest of the day or can you kind of manage to flip it back if you keep kind of pushing through? Oh man, I can flick between the two in like five minutes. Go from thinking a song's fantastic to thinking it's awful in a really short space of time and vice versa. No, it doesn't doesn't hang around for long. Does that make the process quite exhausting if you're kind of flip-flopping back and forth It's like definitely that? exhausting. It's also quite rewarding, you know, I guess you're... If you know that you can feel that good and happy about it, you can know it can happen again. So you're kind of you're looking for that next moment where you feel really good about it, and you can kind of push through the ne- the kind of negative, bad bits. How many days in the studio do you kind of you know feel fulfilled when you get to the end of the day? Do they come quite frequently or? No, they don't come very frequently at all. I mean, I try and put the time in the best I can, but I mean, it's probably I don't have a very high hit rate at all. I, I write loads of songs and loads of music. No one will ever hear it because it's not good enough. I guess that the the two schools of thought are: you just work when you feel inspired, and you normally come up with something good, or you put the time in, and occasionally something good will turn up. And I'm more of the second kind of school of thought. Yeah, like kind of Nick Cave. Yeah, it, very much like Nick Cave. A lot of the stuff Nick Cave says in Twenty Thousand Days rings very true to me. Better to act on a bad idea than not act at all and stuff like that. He, could, he sits at his desk every day, right? He's kind of in there nine till five, yeah. waiting for creativity to catch him in the act. Yeah, exactly. He's there nine till five just writing, and I think he thinks something good will come along if he does that. It's like Roald Dahl or, or you know, authors like that. They just sit down and start writing, and something good will come along. And I think if you look at people that work like that, they do have more they put more work out there because they're making more i was listening to your interview with liz actually and i know she's the other school of thought you know she doesn't try and do it every day and when she does get into the studio she normally smacks it out the park too so i guess there's something good to be said for both yeah both kind of stressful in their own way though because i imagine if you have a period where you don't go into the studio it maybe starts to linger at the back of your mind a little bit and you're kind of wondering when the creativity is going to return yeah I guess you're kind of just waiting for inspiration to strike and you don't know when that's going to happen. Whereas with mine and Nick's method, you just, you know, you're doing it anyway, so you don't feel that kind of, that worry or that kind of, that waiting. How much of the process do you feel like you want, how, more, how much of your own process, sorry, do you feel like you understand now and how much of it is kind of still a mystery to you? It's still a mystery, I think. I, like, I know how to play guitar and bass 
and I'm confident of that. But being able to do those things doesn't really, I mean, obviously it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't help you write songs. And that kind of, that spark of creativity or inspiration or when you actually come up with something good, you don't, you know, you don't need to be able to play an instrument to have that. And I have no idea where that comes from. It just, sometimes it comes, most of the time it doesn't. And you kind of have to be around for it. But no, I've, I've no idea. If I did know, I would be doing a lot more than I am now. Do you get that spark though in other places in your life? Or just music? I guess it's not a spark of creativity, but you kind of, you know, sometimes everything falls into place. Like I went for a walk yesterday and I was listening to a podcast and just walking by the River Thames actually. And I felt like really, you know, felt really satisfied. It felt really good. Everything was in in the right place and I you know that doesn't always happen but when it does it's really worthwhile and you can't you can't force that either it just turns up sometimes you know you can move yourself in the right direction for it but that kind of that moment where the stars align is kind of out of your control a bit I think walks can be dangerous as well though like I quite often <laughs> I feel like you can go you can go for a walk and you start thinking in a different way and you can fall down a rabbit hole and start to think about it, it can it can you know have either effect yeah, they can quite easily go the other way as well, and before you know it, you're kind of walking along with a grey cloud above your head. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I guess, I guess, life can take that turn in the same way that creativity can. You know, it's not always that's that's kind of the equation. That's the trade-off. Like, it's not always good. You don't always have that spark of creativity or positivity with you, which is why it's more special when you do get it. What's the longest you've gone without getting that spark then, or the longest you've gone without writing a good song? I mean. I probably like a good song if I'm honest my, with myself. Probably a year, year and a half. When I first, when I did that first Toothless record, put that out, I probably did about a year and a half. And I was, you know, I was putting the time in, I was showing up, but nothing good was coming. And I kind of, I don't know. I guess that was about the time where my perspective in songwriting was changing, and that real dry spell led up to me doing Good Day and all of those, those songs we've been talking about, which were a real shift. So I'd say, yeah, a year and a half without anything good and with a lot, a lot of shit. Like, I wrote some fucking terrible songs in that time. Do you keep a hold of the terrible ones? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're all there. I can <laughs> go back through them to remind me of what I should not be doing. Do you listen back to the good ones or the terrible ones more often? I, well, I don't listen back to the terrible ones that much. I don't listen back to the good ones all that much either. If I'm working on a song, I'll listen back to it. Otherwise, I'll kind of put it away and not think about it. And then when I get when I get it back out and try and finish it, I'll listen to it. And then when songs are out, I don't listen to them. Like they're they're kind of done, in my opinion. Is that when you get the sense of closure? Well, I th- I, th- I think I'm kind of like forcing the sense of closure. You know, like otherwise you can listen back to something and like oh, I wish I did that a bit different, or you have another idea, or you want to change the snare sound or the kick sound or something like that. Whereas if you kind of draw a line under it then it's done and you can play it live you can work it out you can do something new with it but you don't have to listen to that recording anymore i don't i don't listen back to bombay bicycle club at all because it's done i don't listen back to the toothless record i haven't listened to it in four years since it came out and i'll never listen to it again i'm not sure i'll ever listen to these songs i've put out on spotify again i'm not sure if that's a weird thing to do or not but it's definitely how if I you play it. with them you live with them in a different way yeah but although, although you're not listening back to them they're still with you i'm not ashamed of them i i love all of them but it kind of it, to me they kind of feel done and i'll start thinking about things i could do differently or i don't know just thinking thinking about them in a different way and i, I don't really have any interest in doing that i know a lot of people you know friends of mine who are in bands and they listen back to their music all the time and kind of obsess over it and then look at their stats on Spotify, look at all these things. And to me, it doesn't seem like a useful, useful way to spend time. Has what you judge the success of a song on developed and changed with time? I know, I know, but you know, we're speaking there about people who are obsessed with Spotify stats. But what does a song have to do for you to be creatively successful? And how has that kind of notion evolved for you? With Toothless, and it's part of the reason I don't do this, I did look at stats a lot and kind of agonized over them for a bit and at the time that meant success or not success to me 
and I'd be annoyed when I thought a song was really good and no one would listen to it, and I'd be you know surprised or taken aback when other things did well which isn't a very healthy way of doing it. I mean, since Good Day, and actually doing Bombay Bicycle Club, you know, people would stop me in the street and say that they really loved a particular song that we did. And with Good Day, people have come up to me and said that it meant something to them. I mean, it sounds incredibly cheesy, but that seems like a pretty good good way to kind of see how other people about a song and judge it. Is that tough for you at the moment, then, when that's kind of been taken away? The opportunity to bump into people in the street in that same way. I mean, the opportunity is still there, but there's a much you know lower chance of it happening because no one's really going about it at the moment. <laughs> I, I haven't bumped into anyone for weeks. <laughs> I I mean I I do feel a bit annoyed about you know we put that Bombay album out in January. You know, not bumping into people in the street, but you see people at gigs. You play the songs and you res- you react with people. You see what songs they like. They can talk to you after the show, and that's gone away. So you, I don't have such a good idea as to what people like or what they don't again i don't look at spotify or the stats or go on instagram really yeah i mean that's that's a bit annoying not having that interaction with people but hopefully we get it back at some point you know it's not gone away does that almost manifest itself on say anything because there are parts of that something they're almost kind of directly addressing the audience that that's looking at yourself in quite an objective way like i'm not saying anything that hasn't been said before that's kind of looking at your songwriting from quite a front on perspective and almost speaking directly to the audience yeah i guess well they, yeah you're not wrong and um, that, that's kind of not how i thought about it but yeah <laughs> when you say it like that it's it's there how did you think about it I, 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 that song is to me kind of a, a song about not being able to sing all that stuff we're talking about you know my favorite singers couldn't sing etc but having something to say and something still being beautiful even though it kind of at first glance doesn't seem it or sound it, or like the the song about the the line about bird song. I mean, it's all very cheesy when you break it down, isn't it? God, I feel bashful, but um, you know, birds not singing in tune or singing together, but it's a beautiful thing nonetheless. And you know, me not being able to sing, but still having something to say is kind of what I meant. Yeah, I think with the bird song as well, it's a nice way of taking in those little moments, isn't it, in life? Mm. Like kind of just stopping to pause and reflect and kind of gather and these little things that we probably don't know. I mean, I think that's what lockdown's kind of brought for a lot of people is that we don't notice these things in the everyday that, like you say, even though the birds aren't singing in song, it's still mm. beautiful in its own way. Yeah. Did you have, where are you? You're in summer in Scotland, right? Uh, I was up in Aberdeenshire for lockdown. Did you have I'm loads of, oh, you're in Glasgow, I love Glasgow so much. My sister lives in Glasgow. Did you have loads of bird song where you were? Like I've never heard so many birds in London. It's crazy. You know, you could hear the morning chorus. Yeah, I did. I was up in, I mean, the t- I was. I wasn't even like in a town. I was on the outskirts of a town of like 4,000 people. Mm. So I was very kind of isolated and remote. I was five minutes walk from a forest. Amazing. Yeah, I, I, that, like, that was a positive from lockdown, actually being able to hear birds and birdsong and have the time to kind of listen to it without thinking about anything else. Again, a very cheesy thing to say, but the truth nonetheless. Was there anything else you noticed like that? That kind of emerged, maybe not even in a in a sense of noticing things directly in an observational way, but just in life in general, that it kind of brought forth. But the the birds was an amazing one. Um, it kind of brought out the best and worst in people. Like I've never, I think a lot of people kind of came together and were kind beyond you know, beyond what they would normally be, because everyone was in this tough situation together and loads of people lumped in and made it better and then some other people were just <laughs> absolute dicks i've seen such road rage and so many people screaming at each other on the street obviously because they're stressed out and it's really tough but i think people took one of two paths it's kind of everyone lumping in and and trying to see the best in each other or doing like just kind of being out for themselves and being selfish and screaming at each other in the street yeah i mean i saw it Yesterday, a couple of days ago, in the supermarket, the good be- one or the bad one, the bad one, people shouting at each other. Just, oh. At the moment, especially, like it's it's really it's really bad. I guess you know, coming up to Christmas and it's dark all the time. We just had that second lockdown, but people are just fucking angry with each other. Or I mean, maybe just angry at the world, and it, that's where it's coming out, just directed at each other. It's a real shame because as, as we as we were talking about at the beginning, it seemed like quite a positive moment of everyone getting together and helping out yeah it seems i mean we haven't really had a full second lockdown but it seems like the atmosphere of it down um, with you guys was very different mm. to the first 
Yeah, the, the atmosphere was completely different. I mean, it didn't even feel like a lockdown. The first one, there were no cars on the road. You went for a walk and it was like a ghost town. I've never seen it like that. Probably never see it like that again. Yeah, probably. And <laughs> Until the next pandemic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you're, you're right. I, I walked in town a few times and just ran around the area. I went for jogs in the middle of the road because there was no one around. I'd never be able to do that again. Yeah, I mean, you're quite proactive like on tour as well aren't you i mean you tend to kind of go out and explore in a similar kind of way when you're in a different place a specific place yeah i've always tried to do as much as i can you know meet people see the local cities it's such a privilege to be able to do to to be playing in a band and going to do all these places that you would never get to visit if i wasn't doing that it seems like it'd be a wasted opportunity not to and also like it might not happen again, so I need to make the most of it while it's happening, you know. And also, it's, you know, we toured with people. Some people went out and experienced it, and some people stayed in their, t- in their hotel rooms and watched, you know, Manchester United play football on TV. And that just seemed like quite a waste to me, not to kind of go out and experience these places. No, yeah, I agree. Does it change your perspective of where you come from as well when you see all these kind of different cultures? Because, I mean, you've probably experience more cultures now or experience more cities in different countries than i mean probably like 90 percent of the uk population yeah for sure i've i've seen way more than i ever would if i wasn't doing this yeah it puts it into perspective it shows you it's i guess it gives you a snapshot of the uk and what other people think of the uk as well and and what they think about us and who we are when you talk to them but also how other people live their lives and listen to music and go about go about their days it's really exciting i do miss that as well as well as interacting with people on tour have you adopted things from other cultures into your own life i uh, mixed tomato juice and beer <laughs> <laughs> what have i what have i adopted I, not, nothing nothing springing to mind nothing cool or cultural i don't know I found a lot of cool music been to met a lot of really nice people probably not the world is so connected now you know i've eaten some amazing food on tour i had some great drinks but you can probably get it in you know glasgow or london or anywhere else it's more more about the experience and and immersing yourself there yeah i guess after all this is done that's the thing that you're going to remember is the experience and the people you meet yeah totally and i I definitely will already remember that